All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Very excited to have folks joining us this afternoon. You're here with the Community Nature Connection Training Institute and our trainer today, Jeffrey Esparza for Snake Ecology of the LA Area, Myths and Truths. <laughs> So thanks everybody so much for being here. We're going to get started in just a moment. Um, my name is Celeste Gasparic and I use she, her pronouns. I am the Director of Training and Impact with Community Nature Connection. And I'm joining you today from Tongva and Quiche land, otherwise known as Northeast Los Angeles. I would love to get a sense of who's all joining us um, this afternoon. So if you wanna share your intro in the chat box, um, let us know your name and pronouns, where you're joining us from. And if you're representing any organization today, shout that out. Um, and also we encourage um, you to share what ancestral land you're joining from today. Uh, if you're not sure, you can look it up and I will um, pop a link in the chat right now for you to look that up. And yeah, I'm really excited to get started to see everybody's um, intro in the chat and see who's joining us today. So a uh, little housekeeping, I wanna let folks know that there is closed captioning available um, for this training. You can click on um, the CC button at the bottom of your screen and that will allow you to show, uh, see the captions for today. Welcome, welcome. And I'd like to begin today's training with a land acknowledgement. So the, we'll begin by acknowledging the land on which Community Nature Connection operates as the ancestral lands and home of the Tongva, Gabrieleno, Tataviam, and Chumash peoples. We recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture, and pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. CNC partners with local tribes as part of our efforts to expand equitable outdoor programming to all. And so a little bit about Community Nature Connection, if you're not familiar with our organization, we're a nonprofit CBO. We're based in the Los Angeles area, and our mission is to increase access to the outdoors for communities impacted by racial, socioeconomic, and disability injustices by eliminating existing barriers through advocacy, community centered programming, and workforce development. And this training today is part of the Training Institute, which is one of our programs. Um, the Training Institute provides community and certification training opportunities aiming to increase knowledge and skills and representation in the outdoor field. Um, so before I turn it over to Jeffrey, I want to let folks know that we, um, we are recording the training today. And so it will be posted on uh, Community Nature Connections YouTube channel. Um, and so if you want to revisit it or share it, um, you'll find it there. And I'm also going to be sending a follow-up email after today's training with some of the resource that, resources that Jeffrey is going to be sharing with us. And lastly, um, we're going to have a Q&A session sort of towards the end of today. And so if you have any questions that arise throughout the training today, you can use the Q&A box and that's how we'll keep track of your questions that come up and be able to answer those towards the end of the training today. Um, so without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce today's trainer. Jeffrey Esparza is a biologist, ecologist, and wildlife educator who has experience teaching informally and formally with reptiles, birds, anthropods, and mammals, both in nature and in captivity. Jeffrey holds a bachelor's of science in ecology and evolution and a master's of science in biology. And although most of his research um, experience has been focused in the neotropics, his love for all things wildlife stems from his hometown of Los Angeles. Jeffrey currently works as a lead teacher and field supervisor with BioCitizen LA. So welcome, Jeffrey. We're very happy to have you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to all that are joining and those that continue to join. I'm very excited to give this talk. Um, for the past few weeks, you know, I've been I've been kind of going up and down and 
the one thing that's kept me focused has been working on this snake talk. So I, you know, I come home after work or whatever I'm doing and I just, I put all my energy in this talk and I'm really excited to get started on it because as I've continued to, you know, work with snakes um, throughout my life, pretty much, there's so much misinformation and a lot that folks don't tend to know about snakes. And so when I saw the opportunity, I, I figured this would finally be a good shot to dispel some some myths and and disseminate truth. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to get started. Um, most of my presentations begin just with a little bit of an introduction on what you can expect. And so today I've outlined this talk to go over who I am, um, a little bit about snakes in, in history and in pop culture. And then I want to talk a little bit more on the biology and ecology of snakes, you know, so understanding how they how they function. Then we can talk a little bit more about snakes we find in Los Angeles because, you know, that's the main focus on this talk. And of course, lessons in identification. And I'm almost certain a lot of people here are really interested in rattlesnakes. And uh, I would definitely want to spend part of the talk discussing rattlesnakes, a little bit about trail etiquette and safety. But when we learn about rattlesnakes, you'll see that um, there's, there's a lot we already know that maybe we didn't know uh, before. And then we'll close it up. So before I get started, I'd just like to say thank you again for the introduction. And I just want to say, who am I? So um, just like I was introduced, I'm a biologist and ecologist and a teacher. Uh, I'm also a student. I didn't write a student, but I always I consider myself a student. I have you know a degree in a bachelor's degree in ecology evolution and a master's in biology, but um, learning never stops and you're always a student. And just like um, just like they said, I have a lot of research experience most of which has been in the neotropics. So if you're not familiar, that's a Central and South American tropical, tropical region. And so most of my research has actually been in South America, um, in the Amazon and in the Pantanal. And I've worked on a, a variety of different species, including spiders and insects and birds and bats, and uh, most recently armadillos, of which I'm very much in love with. And I would love to discuss all things tropical forest uh, with you all, but a lot of people, myself included, often think, you know, the, the best way to get associated with wildlife is to, to go to these far out places uh, when truthfully, you know, we have a lot of diversity here, especially in Southern California, we have so much diversity. And my passion for wildlife, while I really enjoy the tropical forest, and I'm not going to deny that, it stemmed from Los Angeles. And the things that I would find in my backyard or on trails hiking. And so I wanna emphasize that because there's, there's so much life around and here in Los Angeles, we're just bursting with wildlife. So um, I think that's, that's pretty much important. And so the, the first question that might come to mind is, okay, you're an ecologist, you're interested in tropical mammals, why do you wanna discuss snakes? And so professionally, I've been working with snakes for close to 10 years when I, when I, you know, I've just been working with them in some capacity, whether it's through zoos or uh, nonprofit sanctuaries, or, you know, as I started getting more involved in research as an undergraduate and graduate student, um, I've been working directly um, or indirectly with snakes. And so whether it's, you know, 2015 and my first field expedition deep in the Amazon, or as recently as last year, in San Gabriel's, uh, the only thing that's truly changed has been my age and uh, my education. I've learned a lot more over the years, but I've, I've always been fascinated by them. And um, as I've worked with them, I've learned to handle them in captivity. And as I've been in the field collecting them for different projects or just to show the students or you know out, out with a, a, a bunch of students and myself, I've, I've grown accustomed to them. And uh, they're so exciting. I just, I find them so unique and so interesting. And so I wanted to spend some time and that's why I chose uh, uh, snakes as a topic because they are a passion. And while I don't have research experience and as much research experience with them, I think I have a lot to offer. And so the first question, and I encourage you to use the, the chat function for this because I, I think this is, this is gonna be, uh, I'm curious to see what you're gonna say. So the question I pose to everyone watching this talk is what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word snake? And it could be anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, ecology focus or biology focus. Like, what is the first thing that comes to mind? 
And so getting bit, danger, caution, slither, lots of fear, beauty. I like that one. Scary, scary, scary. Be careful, scary. So I'm going to uh, leave it at that. I, I see sneaky is a good one. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So that's kind of what I anticipated. When we hear the word snake, you know, maybe you think, oh, cool, an animal, no legs. Or maybe you think of a celebrity because the, the headline is, oh, this, this celebrity is slithering over here. Or they're sneaky. They're a snake. If you're, if you're inter in, interested in sports, you might equate that to someone who, who left the team that you enjoy. So snakes are often seen with a negative point of view. And that's kind of the point I was, I was getting across. And truthfully, when you, when you think of snakes, they're quite unique. Uh, they don't have eyelids. They smell with their tongue. They are covered in scales. They have no limbs. So on a very surface level, snakes are interesting and they are pretty unique and they're definitely different from, from the way we look. And so we just on a superficial level, we might notice that they're different. If we're looking at snakes throughout history, um, this can also illustrate a different picture. And if you're looking through history and culture, it just depends on which culture. They're often shrouded in mysticism and superstition. They're often, you know, centerpieces of different religious interpretations. And whether that's positive or negative obviously depends on what you're searching for and how, on how you're choosing to, to look at the sources. If you're interested in movies and media, um, I think a similar pattern comes to mind. So as I was writing this talk, I thought of the first four movies that involved snakes, uh, Harry Potter, a jungle book, Snakes on a Plane, and Anaconda, which I like all these movies, but um, actually I, um, I wanted to just get the point across is that you can kind of see a theme here. Uh, negative, sneaky, you know, a central theme in Harry Potter that has a, a ton of different themes. So we tend to see them as, as we see them in culture, as secretive, elusive, and mysterious. And when you combine that with the fact that there are a lot of different snakes that are venomous and there are plenty of snakes in the world that do pose serious threats, um, sometimes folks tend to think they all pose serious threats, even though even the most venomous snakes in the world, if given proper respect, are really nothing to worry about. You know, they are seldom a threat if you just understand that and understand and respect them. And so I wanted to use that as a jumping point and uh, use it as a method to, to move forward. So today I want to learn about snakes. So what I'm going to be focusing on during this talk is scientific classification. So if you're unfamiliar, the, 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 way, we, the, the way scientific classification works is that everything revolves around its hierarchy. And if you trace any organism's lineage far enough back in time, you will find a common ancestor. And so the way we, we use this in biology and ecology is that, you know, I'm using a rattlesnake uh, diamondback as an example, but it's in the same kingdom of animals. And as the further you get down this pyramid, you see that you start to get more similar in characteristics. So within this class of reptiles, we have this order. Within this order, there's this family. And then there's the genus and of course the species. So Crotalus atrox. So I pose this because I'm going to be referencing family and order a lot throughout this talk, mostly family. And so I want us to be familiar with that. But if you look at this upside down pyramid, it's kind of like it might be a lot for, for us to consume. And so another way that I use it or equate it to is uh, as a tree of life. And so one resource I want to give to you all is just one I've, I've used online when I was teaching different classes. It's called onezoom.org. And of course, it'll be linked later. But this is an interactive tree of life. And it's much more intuitive than looking at a pyramid because you can actually see life on this tree. And as I mentioned, if you, if you follow anything's lineage far enough back in time, you come to a common ancestor. And so today, uh, we're going to be talking about reptiles. As you can see on this tree of life, it has it as sauropsids, which uh, includes birds. If you're unfamiliar, birds are um, very closely related to reptiles and crocodilians. This is another topic of biology that we're not going to be discussing today. So um, we're going to just focus on reptiles. And for all of us to understand is that um, we use different traits and genetics to come to these conclusions. And so within the class, of reptilia, 
you know, we have birds, or, I'm sorry, we have crocodilians, turtles, snakes, and lizards. So within reptilia, um, we, we come to another section. So lizards and snakes are very closely related. You can see that where they diverged, they have a common ancestor. And so lizards and snakes belong to this order known as squamata. So lizards and snakes, they're very closely related. Specifically in this order, squamata, there's a suborder. So another section going down that pyramid, and that would be serpentes or the snakes. So all snakes on this tree of life are right nestled right here on this different node right here. And snakes, you know, we might think, okay, well, what separates snakes from lizards? And there's a number of things that has them close together, but I wanted to focus just on general characteristics of snakes and things that apply to all snakes. And with respects to all snakes and reptiles is that they're all ectothermic, meaning that they uh, regulate their body temperature through external sources. If a snake is cold, it needs to move in sunlight to warm up. And if a snake stays in sunlight for too long, it's going to overheat. So that's what ectothermic means. They regulate through outside sources. Snakes, uh, like other reptiles, are covered in keratinized scales. So keratin being the same, um, same thing that's found in your fingernails, that is what a snake skin is. Snakes shed their skin. They shed their skin typically in one piece, and it's pretty awesome to see. And they don't have eyelids, like I said. So uh, no eyelids, no limbs. Um, you can see I wrote some snakes have vestigial limbs. So really small, like little spurs on certain species of snake. But again, we're talking limbless. We're talking covered in scales. And another thing about snakes, just for us to generally know is that they tend to have pretty long lifespans. You know, they can get up to 20 years um, and very slow metabolism. So snakes, they often only eat maybe a few times a year. And even then they can go longer than a year without eating. So remarkable when you think about it and really exciting. And one thing that we often don't realize is that snakes are really important. They're very important in their respective ecosystems in, in keeping that in balance. These are carnivores and whether the prey is as small as a termite or as large as an alligator or a deer, the fact that snakes are in ecosystems is important for keeping balance. If you remove top predators out, it, it kind of creates a cascade effect and it can, it can really mess with things. So when we remove snakes, that's affecting everything long-term. And I even wrote this, this tidbit that, you know, snakes and owls on a barn are much more efficient at controlling pests uh, than feral cats and, and rat poison. So they're ecologically important is, is the focus that I want to present on snakes. And again, they have this evolutionary millions of years head start. So you can wonder why. Not just as hunting, but also as sources of food, whether, you know, it's birds or even other snakes, but snakes aren't the, generally, you know, like the, the biggest and baddest. There are some really big snakes in the world, but um, oftentimes they are prey too to something larger. So Again, it's all a balance and they're all very integral to that balance. In terms of the anatomy, if you were unfamiliar, snakes are vertebrates, so they do have a backbone. And you can see in this image, their entire body is essentially one large backbone. And I know when I used to teach students or continue to teach students, and I tell them snakes have a backbone, they go, like, whoa, that's wild. Like, I can't believe that. Um, and you can see the rib, that's why they're able to slither in sort of an S shape is because the entirety of their body is a rib cage. And if you notice some of these photos, you can see they have really, really big mouths. <laughs> and the reason why is that the, the way their, their jaw is structured, it's very different from us. So first of all, snakes do have teeth. The, depending on the species, there are different types of teeth. And we won't get too much into that, but you should know they do have teeth and their jaws are very flexible where we have, you know, a chin and a very um, solid mandible or lower jaw. Snakes have this noticeable gap right here. And so where that gap is, is essentially this stretchy rubber band like ligament. And that allows the snake to open its mouth at this obnoxiously large uh, size. And so typically, if you see a snake and an animal it's eating, folks might think, oh, that's way too big for it. But it, more often than not, it's, it's probably not too big for the snake to eat. Again, combined with the fact that they don't eat that often to begin with, 
um, and their slow metabolism, it starts to make sense. And when I used to teach students, I would tell them that it's kind of like if we were to eat a watermelon, um, swallowing it whole. So our mouth would have to physically be able to open to swallow a watermelon, which is really exciting for me. So um, yeah, snakes have these remarkable jaws and that explains how they're able to open their mouths so large. In terms of their senses, generally speaking, they have poor vision um, and they don't have ears. So they lack external ears and the way they, they hear is that they sense vibrations. So if you whisper to the snake like, hey, excuse me, it's not really gonna notice, but if you're walking towards it, as long as its chin's on the ground, it's gonna feel that and it's gonna react accordingly. And there are other senses that some snakes have that we'll discuss later. Um, but the other thing that we all know is that snakes, you know, smell with their tongue. But if you've ever wondered how exactly that process works, it's that they stick their tongue out. As you can see in the illustration, they, they taste everything in the air. And whenever the tongue goes back inside the mouth, it hits that special organ, Jacobson's organ. And that's how they get all those signals. And, you know, they can taste and they're smelling for other snakes, for predators, for prey. Um, they use that sense of smell and that's why they're constantly sticking their tongue out and that's why it's forked. So it can, it can taste in different directions. So very exciting. And in terms of distribution, again, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this talk is because pretty much no matter where you go in the world, you're probably gonna come across a snake if you're interested in them at least. And if you're not, you know, you can see there's only a handful of unlucky places in the world that don't have snakes. And they're even in some of our oceans. So you can see the Pacific, for example, there are snakes in the ocean. Obviously, you know, we can spend a lot of time discussing all those snakes, but we're focused on a very specific part of the world. Um, of course, we're focused on Los Angeles. Now, remember I've referenced this tree of life and I referenced that I was gonna be using terms like family, level and order. So we got the order in the suborder with snakes. The next thing I want to talk about on the tree of life is the family level. So I'm going to be using this term family. And again, that this is what I'm referencing. And in California, there's a total of six snake families, five of which are native. So there's only one non-native species. And those following families are Boadae. So these are the boas and anacondas and sand boas. We do have boas in Los Angeles, um, this rosy boa and we have rubber boas. Colubridae is another family. So your king snakes, your garter snakes, racers, et cetera. Alapidae, really cool family. These are the coral snakes, the cobras, the mambas and the sea snakes. And so while we don't have cobras and mambas and even coral snakes here, we do have sea snakes. Probably more difficult to see, but again, never say never. Leptotyphlopidae, a really unique family of snakes. Um, these are blind snakes or thread snakes. I've never seen one of these, but um, they're here and they're definitely recorded. So definitely got to mention them. Viperidae, so a very exciting family. These are the vipers and the rattlesnakes. And the last one that is not native is Typhlopidae or the Brahmini blind snake. And you can see an image of me holding one. I found this one last year. It's a very exciting encounter um, to see a vertebrate so incredibly small. Um, but again, this snake is actually not native here, but they are established. And so a lot of different families that we can discuss. I'm mostly focused on two of those families, Colubridae and Viperidae. And I'm interested in these families for a few different reasons. Um, before I explain that, I, again, I wanna just shout out another app. If you don't already have iNaturalist, I strongly encourage you to download it. Really awesome resource. Um, I'm sure most of us have it, but on the off chance that you don't, this is a really amazing resource to take photos of wildlife, upload them and, and see and get good data on, on records of wildlife. And so, as of April 18th, 2022, when I was writing this talk, um, part of last week, I went on iNaturalist and I wanted to reference, you know, how many snakes were in Los Angeles that we had recorded. And as of last week, there were 25 species at over 7,000 observations in Los Angeles alone. So that number is likely increased and it's definitely not a definitive number. Obviously people have seen plenty more snakes that weren't recorded, but just to get a general idea on, on the amount of snakes we have. And so the uh, next question is, okay, well, which species have actually been recorded? What have we actually seen? And so again, using iNaturalist, I went on and I wanted to see the top 
top uh, recorded species. And you can see there's quite a lot, 25 species in Los Angeles. If we're thinking of the family level, um, we can see that there's four vipers, uh, 18 colubrids, there's one, um, and then one apiece for the rest, one blind snake, one thread snake, and one coastal rosy boa. So a lot of diversity. And you can see why I opted to, to talk about Viperidae and Colubridae with the most species, especially with those colubrids. Um, and some of these species, you know, you're probably not going to see. I know this corn snake has one observation, and these are really common as pets. And so that's probably someone's escaped pet. But all the other ones are here. Specifically, if we want to look at uh, the top observations, we got to talk about the, the Western rattlesnake, Southern Pacific at over 2,000 observations, very exciting snake. And then I thought, okay, let's discuss the next seven. So kind of like the top eight snakes in Los Angeles that all come in at over 150 uh, observations on iNaturalist. No offense to the Mojave rattlesnake, you, you definitely got to go out to the desert to see that. I don't think you're going to see it here like in Griffith Park, for example. And the coast night snake didn't make the cut, but after we discuss some of these snakes, I'm very, um, I'm, I'm very sure that we will be able to identify all the other snakes and even more. And I encourage us to do so. So rattlesnakes number one, but I definitely want to talk about uh, the colubrids first. And another important website uh, where I got all my information pretty much on snakes, the distributions, and honestly, a lot of the photos came from this website, CaliforniaHerbs.com. And so if you're interested in snakes or just even remotely interested in reptiles and amphibians and you live in California, you have to reference this site. It is immaculate. It is amazing. And so the, the family I wanted to talk about first is Colubridae. So this is the largest snake family in the world, coming in at a whopping 257 genera. So even more species of Colubrids. And they're mostly non-venomous, although there are some that are venomous and typically not dangerous to humans. And you can see that in these photos, they come in variable coloration, all sorts of colors, and they are constrictors. So uh, when they grip their prey, they constrict and squeeze really tight. And methods of reproduction are oviparous, meaning they lay eggs, ovoviviparous, meaning they lay an egg internally, and then that egg hatches in the belly and they give birth. And then there's viviparous, uh, in which they actually give birth, so no internal egg. So snakes do all three of them. And we're going to discuss a, a number of these. The first of which is prob not, not surprising to me, the second most recorded snake in Los Angeles, the gopher snake. Uh, really common, uh, pretty easy to identify, although they do kind of look similar to rattlesnakes. Their bodies aren't nearly as thick. They're, they're kind of beige, brownish. They're covering all these brown spots and their tail tapers off to kind of like tiger stripes. And they can get pretty big. They can even get up to nine feet. So these are hefty snakes. And the interesting thing, it's not exclusive to gopher snakes, but if they feel threatened, they often coil up and they rapidly wag their tail as a way to kind of mimic a rattlesnake, which is pretty awesome and very successful. And again, a lot of different snakes, including other vipers without rattles, do that as well. So very efficient. And that is our gopher snake. This is definitely the most common snake I see. I've been seeing them my whole life. I always get giddy at seeing them, usually diurnal. So if, you know, if you're hiking out in the day and you see a big snake, my number one question is probably, oh, was it a gopher snake? And if they say, no, I don't think it's a gopher snake, I tend to follow up with, oh, okay, well, did it have a really long stripe? Because this next snake is, at least again, in my personal experience, the most common snake I come across. Uh, this is known as the California whip snake or the California striped racer. Really fast snake. You can identify them with that lateral stripe, right? And they have kind of like a little ear blotch and that darkish color. And sometimes under the tail is, is kind of red, reddish color. Uh, really cool snakes, really fast. So they're known as racers, right? And they're really fast. They have great vision and they can even climb vegetation. And they often do this uh, behavior known as periscoping, in which case they lift their head up and they scan their surroundings. So really, really cool to see. So stripe bracers are really common. You can see, I'll go back uh, the distribution as well. They're all across Los Angeles pretty much. And so really common, especially considering they're active during the day. 
um, I think you're likely to come across a striped racer if you haven't already come across one. They're not the only racer. The other racer that we were going to briefly talk about is the this one. Also, it's known as a red racer or a coach whip. This is actually the only snake that I'm discussing today that I haven't yet seen. Not because they're rare. I just I just haven't found one yet. So they've eluded me, but I hope to come across a coach whip. So named the coach whip because if you look at the base of the tail, it has sort of that braided appearance and looking like a whip. But in terms of the ecology and behavior, very similar to the striped racer. Uh, the difference is in if superficially, you know, we're looking at the colors, the reddish, they have sort of a darker head, sometimes an all black or brown head. Um, but again, diurnal. And if you're, if you see one, the, definitely let me know, because that's very exciting. And the other snake, probably the most common snake when you hear people discuss snakes, they, they say garter snake, right? So we do have garter snakes in Los Angeles. And the one that we have close by is the two stripes garter snake. And so for this snake, you might see some similarities with the, the striped racer, I think. Definitely a lack of the stripe though. There's a little bit of spot spotted pattern and, and the face might look similar, but if you compare them side by side, you notice the differences. And a key difference is where you're going to find them. These are usually found in or near water. So really good at swimming. I remember I was working with students before and they said they saw an eel in fresh water. So I immediately knew what it was. And sure enough, I, it was this cute little garter snake that I, I showed everyone. Really exciting. And an interesting thing about these, this specific garter snake, two sharp garter snake, is that they often prey on California newts, these other amphibians that are highly poisonous. And so when you have something like this snake that is hunting a poisonous animal, that's a selective pressure for natural selection to select for a, a more poisonous newt. So if, if newts are getting eaten, the ones that are more likely to survive are gonna be more poisonous. And so if there are snakes hunting really poisonous newts, the snakes most likely to survive are the snakes that are more resistant to that poison. So it leads to this evolutionary arms race that ultimately leads to these newts being so over the top poisonous and dangerous and these snakes that are remarkably resistant to that. And so if another animal might want to eat a newt, it's not going to be good for them. And just, just an interesting tidbit really on, on evolution and natural selection. It's such, a, such an interesting thing. And so this garter snake is ovo viviparous. So they lay an internal egg and then they give birth to that. And again, if you're hiking around water, uh, you're more likely to see some of these snakes. Now, the next few snakes I wanted to discuss, but then I thought, hmm, there's definitely a trend here. And again, this is a trend that I encourage you to use the chat function and just let me know, uh, what do you notice? Like, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you see these snakes? I see colorful, brightly colored, bold, vibrant colors, bright, perfect. This is exactly what I was, exactly what I was hoping for. So we're seeing these really vivid colors. And if, if you're on the trail and you see something like this, something in your gut might tell you what's going on. Like something doesn't add up. And it, it's, it's definitely something, right? There's definitely bold contrasting colors. And if you equate that to other animals that have bold contrasting colors, this light bulb is gonna, gonna click. And even if you're thinking a skunk that is very bold, black and white, and we know better than to mess with skunks or certain butterflies that are toxic that other birds definitely don't want to eat because of those colors. So this is known as aposomatic coloration. And these are warning colors. These colors are signals to you. They are telling you, leave me alone. Um, I remember seeing this tarantula hawk for the first time in high school. I was hiking on a trail and I saw this huge orange and jet black blue wasp and something in my gut said, you got to leave that thing alone. And so these are generally honest signals that communicate danger, whether it's a spider that is black and red communicating to the bird, hey, leave me alone, I'm not worth it. Whether it's the skunk, as I said, very tough and stocky dart frogs, or whether it's a bee that might sting you. Uh, these communicate, right? And they generally work. And I purposely use this slide 
because I know if, if you're an entomologist watching this, you're probably just screaming, rolling your eyes saying, why would you choose that photo of a bee? Because really? And so if you are an entomologist, I assure you that uh, I'm a presenter too. And I did this on purpose because there's something, there's something unique about this bee that I mentioned. And so if we compare this bee to another picture of a bee that we're familiar with, you might say, huh, you know, some, something's, something's up here. That thing on the right looks a little different from the bee that we're all familiar with. The antenna are a little different, the wings are different. Even the colors are, are uh, there, but a little different, but there are other species of bees, so. What if we put both of these species, these individuals uh, in the same photo? And so you say, oh, okay, yeah, that one's eating the other one. So that really big obnoxious looking bee is eating the little bee. I didn't know bees ate things. And that's because this actually isn't a bee. The larger one is a fly. It's known as a robber fly. And in this case, this robber fly eats bees. And so this is known as mimicry. So an evolutionary strategy of a mimic mimicking a model. The model in this case would be the thing that is dangerous. Let's say it's the bee. And the mimic, uh, like in this image, this is another native uh, hoverfly. It's essentially pretending to be the bee. It's using that color scheme as a warning. Now in mimicry, there's a couple of different versions of mimicry and we won't go too into it. Just know that it's usually where the model is dangerous using an honest signal and the mimic is not. Sometimes though, the mimic can also be dangerous, but I'm gonna be focusing on the other version, Batesian mimicry. And this type of mimicry only works if there aren't too many mimics. So I keep saying the word mimic, but if you think about it, if every bee you came across uh, was not dangerous, we would no longer be afraid of bees, right? So mimicry can only work if there aren't too many. And the cool thing about mimicry is it can be found across the tree of life, uh, including in snakes. Now, you don't have to be a seasoned entomologist to, to find some of these trends. If you look at both of these images, I chose them for a reason. So with bees and, and flies, flies typically have much smaller antenna, as you can see. Uh, flies only have two wings and they typically have those really big bug eyes. And bees have four wings, longer antenna, usually smaller eyes. So um, you can probably find it out. And if you see them out in the wild, I definitely encourage you don't run away and take a look first. But with snakes, the aposomatic colors, they don't always follow a rule. We're usually taught a rule that and a rhyme, which I'm not even gonna say because it just comes with so much red tape in my opinion, but um, this rhyme, it, it is used to identify one species of coral snake with a couple of our king snakes in North America. And it has to do with the pattern, you know, the red and the black and the yellow and the white. And the reason why I say that it doesn't always work is because in this image, there are four harmless snakes and two very venomous snakes. One of those venomous snakes being on the top left, this coral snake, uh, which is black, yellow, red, yellow, black. The other really dangerous snake is actually on the top right. This is a South American coral snake. And it's got red, black, white, black, and it's the same pattern as this non-venomous snake. So if you see these bright colors, and you're not experienced with snakes, definitely take a step back because it's telling you something and you don't want to find out if it's, if it's the mimic, right? <laughs> you just want to assume that it's the model. And so luckily for us, all our local boldly colored snakes are non-venomous or I should say harmless to humans. And we're going to be discussing those today. Uh, the next one on our list is the ring neck snake. So named because you can see that bright uh, ring around the neck. And this snake is really cool because if it feels threatened, it shows the underside of its belly and the tail where it's really bright red. And that's like a flare saying, please walk away. Nothing to see here. These are usually smaller. I've seen one really small fit in the palm of my hands. It was so exciting to see. Um, and they are mildly venomous. Now, again, the venom, the venom for these ring neck snakes is meant for really small prey like salamanders and worms, slugs or whatnot, but they, they, are, um, they are venomous, but probably have nothing to worry about, usually on the smaller side. And I tend to find them more in you know, moist areas, but and they're across Los Angeles and they're more secretive. From what I read is that mostly nocturnal, but more on the secretive side. 
So that is our ringneck snake, Diadokis punctatus. Uh, the next one, probably my favorite, I, I say that a lot, but this might be my favorite snake in California. This is the California king snake. So the world famous, I call it, even though maybe it's not world famous. King snakes are so named because of the fact that they can hunt and consume other snakes, including rattlesnakes. And so the same way we named the king cobra, the king of snakes, because they eat other snakes, it's even in their scientific name, these king snakes also hunt and consume rattlesnakes. And I've seen it before. It was absolutely mind-blowing to see a king snake chowing down on a rattlesnake. Um, you can identify the California king snake based on the alternating black and white, brownish, creamish color banding, though. Not going to get much more than four feet, so pretty big. Um, but yeah, they're pretty easy to identify with those bold contrasting colors. And I remember I found one, uh, I think I was either in high school or in college, like early college. And I picked it up to relocate it. And the mailman was like, careful, careful, that one's dangerous. And again, it's just that signal to your brain. And, and I said, no, I, I, this, one's, this one's okay. But even at me second guessing, I was, and I had to double check, but my instincts were, were proven correct because I know our local snakes, obviously. But again, if, if your mind is telling you something, trust it. The other king snake that we have is the California mountain king snake or the coast mountain king snake. Beautifully colored, probably the most beautiful snake uh, that we have in California. We have two species, Lampropeltes zonata and Lampropeltes multifasciata. multifasciata. And that one you can see on the range map is the orangish yellowish color. So that one's in our Los Angeles area. If you go a little bit further north, you might come across uh, the California mountain king snake. Um, these bands, they're usually consistent you know, red touches black, which touches white, which touches black, which touches red, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty consistent pattern patterns. But again, there's always an exception to the rule. There's always variation. Um, again, we don't have coral snakes here in Los Angeles, but if you're unsure, just leave it alone. But I assure you, it's likely just coast mountain king snake and if you do come across one definitely take a photo because very exciting when i first finally saw one last year i lost my mind i got so excited it was truly such an incredible encounter and um i had been just been on the hunt you know the search for one for so long and like the other king snake diurnal so you're likely to come across them usually more common in riparian or areas with with water you're more likely to come across these snakes um, but take a photo and upload it if you do see one. I know the folks at the museum would be very excited to talk about it. And so those are all our colubrids that I wanted to discuss at least. Again, just briefly, just give you some general insight on how to identify some of them. Again, I think you're more likely to come across those. But of course, we got to talk about the vipers next. Venomous live bearing snakes. So if you didn't know, vipers give birth. It's in their name, viviparis or viparidae. So they give birth to young and some of them are actually pretty good parents. We tend to think snakes evil, rattlesnakes worse, but rattlesnakes, again, they give birth. And like I said, sometimes they can even be good parents. There are multiple subfamilies within Viparidae. In Southern California, we have Crotalinae. So these are the pit vipers. And if you look at all of these images, these are all pit vipers. You can see um, the eyeball. And then just next to the eyeball, you see that little, looks like a nostril. So that is a heat pit. And you can see it on all these images, including this yellow one beautifully right there. So those heat pits are another sense in which they can sense and detect heat. So for, if you wanna say a warm blooded animal, like a mouse, they can, they can see that. They can sense that heat signature and they use that and they use all their senses. They are venomous, but that venom is meant for hunting. Again, we have this animal, they're usually really large bodied really fat with a triangular head. Um, I threw in this image here. You can kind of just, just a brief image so you can kind of get a, a look at what I'm discussing. So you can see the triangular arrow head on the left for vipers and then the oval shaped head on the right for usually colubrids, but could also be a lapid. So just keep in mind, but here in Los Angeles, if you see that triangle head, it's probably a viper. If you see that elliptical pupil or the slit, probably nocturnal, it's probably a viper. And of course, if you see the rattle, definitely a viper. Now, some snakes can mimic these rattlesnakes, like I said. Some snakes will flatten their head and make it look 
triangular and they'll start whipping their tail left and right. But um, around here, that's not going to fool us because we know about the rattle. So we'll figure that out. Specifically with the rattle, I want to talk about, you know, what's actually in the rattle. And so like their scales are made of keratin, they're composed of interlocking chains. And each baby is actually born with one little button. And every time they shed their skin, they get another segment. So a logical question is, can you age them based on the rattle? And the answer is no, you can't because over time, they're gonna lose some of those rattles. But if you see a big hefty snake with a lot of rattles, it's probably old, but it's not gonna have its original rattle to continue to grow more and more and more. And the interesting thing about rattles is that those sound waves are amplified because the rattle's hollow. So it's not a maraca, there's no beads inside. It's just, it's shaking back and forth. And because they're hollow, you can hear that. And this frequency that the rattle sound makes is a frequency that is best heard from mammals. And they can even change that frequency depending on who's approaching. If something is running at it and it's a big shape like a mammal, they might switch the pitch to make you think that they're closer than they actually are. And so this kind of leads into this evolutionary thought that these rattles likely evolved as a method to deter large wandering mammals around. Say, hey, heads up, I'm right here, please don't step on me. And I like to tell folks that like in, in anything, not just rattlesnake, but in any time an animal bites you, it's a lose-lose situation. It's not pleasant for either of you. So if you get bit, you don't like it, and the animal biting you definitely doesn't like it. So uh, keep that in mind. Rattlesnakes are venomous. If you hear poisonous, you don't have to roll your eyes. You know what they're saying, but there is a difference. If you want to get technical, venom is injected, poison is ingested. And so if a poisonous frog bites you, you're going to be fine. But if you eat the poisonous frog, you're not going to be fine. Vice versa with the rattlesnake. Again, if someone says that snake poisonous, you know what they're talking about. Um, but if you want to get snippy, you can correct them. <laughs> I don't think it works that often. Like they don't like it, <laughs> but it's just something to know. And so our world famous uh, local resident, the number one iNaturalist snake champion of Los Angeles is the Southern Pacific rattlesnake. Large bodied triangular head. They got that beautiful pattern, very cryptic. You can definitely see in that image and in the image before they have amazing camouflage. And that tells you all you need to know about this animal in my opinion. They want nothing to do with you. You are getting in their way. They want to hide. They don't want to be seen. They are probably in the midst of something. And so, again, if, if you're still unsure, look for the rattle. Look for the heat pits. You can definitely see the heat pits, and they're pretty cool to see in person. Mostly nocturnal, but again, most of the rattlesnakes I've seen have been in the day. They're just more active at night. And really at the centerpiece of so much misinformation and myths about snakes in general, it always comes down to the rattlesnakes. And so I wanted to take some time to dissect just a handful of those myths, just to let us know that to ease our minds on the trails, because if you're apprehensive of hiking because of rattlesnakes, that's fine. They are venomous, but there are certain things that you've probably heard that don't hold up. One of which being is that juveniles are more dangerous than adults because they cannot control the amount of venom they inject. So this has been a tale that I've heard my whole life. People continue to tell me. Uh, it's actually not true though. There's no sh studies that show juveniles inject more venom than adults. I mean, if anything, adults have more venom to inject. So you can likely argue the opposite. Maybe the adults more dangerous because they have a lot more venom. On the other hand, you can argue, well, newborns are a lot smaller. Sometimes they don't even have a rattle. They're harder to see. So they're potentially more dangerous. So which is it? It's neither. It's they're a rattlesnake and you need to just give them space and you have nothing to worry about. But if, if you're especially afraid of a baby because you think they can't control the amount they inject, don't have to worry about that. That is not true. Another myth though, is that they're very aggressive. Rattlesnakes are very aggressive. They'll go out of their way and chase you out of the trail and as, you, as I say that out loud, you might even hear like, mm, yeah, that's probably not true. And it's not. They're sit and wait predators. So they're ambush predators. And you're more likely to come across a rattlesnake doing just that, sitting and waiting, desperately hoping you walk away because you're getting in it's the midst of its flow. It's trying, to, it's trying to mind its business. Leave me alone. And remember, venom, it didn't really evolve for the rattlesnake, didn't evolve as a, a, 
a means of defense, it evolved as a means of offense. So they use it to hunt. When they bite their prey, um, it, it puts venom in them. And then the snake later uses their tongue to smell that trail of venom and where the animal is. And then they consume the snake. I'm um, sorry, they consume the prey. And again, they have that camouflage. They rely on that to hunt. The rattle is a bonus for us here. It's used to ward off accidents, I like to call them. So it's just saying, hey, leave me alone, please. And just do just that. Um, I've never heard of a rattlesnake going out of its way. If you try and poke and pry a rattlesnake, you can likely guess what's gonna happen. The poor nervous thing is going to defend itself. Um, but again, it's a lose-lose situation. Another myth though that we hear is that rattlesnakes often rattle first, and that's not necessarily true. If you sneak up on a rattlesnake and you accidentally step on it and it didn't hear you, it's not gonna rattle first. It's gonna say, whoa, what's going on? And it might try and strike. So the rattle's a, a warning, but it's not uncommon for it to strike without the rattle. But again, if we use our knowledge before, that's likely not gonna happen if we keep our eyes peeled. And finally, another myth that we hear is that, you know, they're always deadly. And while it can be dangerous to get bit, it's not true. They're not always deadly. First of all, sometimes snakes will even bite without injecting venom. So it is possible. It doesn't happen that often, but it is possible for a rattlesnake to bite and no venom is injected. It's kind of like the last ditch effort to please leave me alone. Um, but while venom, again, I'm not trying to downplay venom at all. It can be fatal, but if treated promptly, it rarely ever is. And so if you ever are in an emergency, you probably know the best thing you can do is just call 911, get out of there. And if you can get out of there, get out of there. Call 911. We think, again, we have all the rattlesnakes here in Southern California. And so there are a lot of anti-venom distributed across the United States. And again, here in Los Angeles. So you'll likely be okay. It'll be a scare, I'm sure. It won't be fun, but you'll probably be okay. Even so, there are certain things we can do to prep ourselves. And this is what I wanted to discuss in closing. And just really briefly is just understanding safety of the trail and understanding that all wildlife deserves respect. So keep that in mind. A rule, a personal rule I follow is that if ever I see an animal and I wanna take a photo of it, if that animal starts to shift its position, you're probably too close. So if you're taking a photo of a deer and you keep walking closer to the deer and the deer eventually backs away, it's telling you, it's saying, hey, that's a little too close for comfort. And the same goes for, for snakes. You know, if the snake doesn't wanna, if a snake isn't interested in you, it'll kind of shift. And in the case of a rattlesnake, it'll rattle its tail. So be mindful, don't go off trail unless you absolutely need to wear the proper foot gear. You know, you can wear boots if you want, if you're doing research or walking off trail. Um, understanding basics in ecology though. These snakes are ectothermic. So we often think, you know, they're active during the hottest, points in the year. And while they are active when the weather gets warmer, if it's too hot for us outside, it's probably too hot for the snake and they'll likely be in the shade. The hottest point in the day, you're more likely to come across the snake, like a rattlesnake lurking or hanging out, chilling in the shade. So keep that in mind, look under the bushes if you're walking. But if you're walking in the center of a trail, brightly sunlit, yeah, it's probably not there. Maybe it's crossing the trail. And that's fine, you just take a step back and allow it to mind its business and it'll be out of your hands. If you have pets that are eager, um, just keep them, I, I think just keeping them on a leash, especially on a trail. But again, we hear that rattle, the, the dogs will likely hear it too. Um, but again, we don't want any accidents to happen. And finally, the most important thing is just don't interact, just leave it alone. I remember I, I read a quote, it said, no one's ever been bit by a snake that they left alone. And it's 100% true. If you leave it alone, it's going to do the same. Um, there's zero reason. Most bites happen because people are trying to kill the snake. And these rattlesnakes that, you know, they even have slow reproductive rates and it, it can take them a few years to, to be sexually mature. If you kill a rattlesnake, you're putting yourself in danger. You're ending the life of another creature. And that is severely impacting the ecosystem. And so I'm certain everyone watching this talk has no interest in killing rattlesnakes. And even those that do have interest in killing rattlesnakes might have good intentions in mind, but they lack the education. And so that's why I encourage us to, to learn about this, talk about it with others and tell them, just leave it alone. I guarantee you the next time you see a rattlesnake, it will be a beautiful encounter. It doesn't have to be scary. It can be equally as exciting. 
And so just to, to wrap it up, these are some of the websites I was mentioning, and we're going to send some of these later. But iNatural is one Zoom, CaliforniaHerbs.com. If you're really interested in the tree of life and taxonomy, you can use this database uh, for a lot more information. I love referencing it for all the latest in taxonomic uh, science. And just to close it out, you can, again, use the chat function. But after hearing this talk, maybe throw in a couple other words that come to mind uh, when you hear the word snake. And I would be interested in reading those. And uh, that will be my finale, finale. So thank you so much for listening. And I will gladly take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was so good. I learned so much and um, you really just kept my kept me sucked in the whole time. So yeah. thank you so much. Um, we have a couple minutes left and we'll uh, take a few of the questions that came in here through the Q&A. Um, how long does it take for a rattlesnake to produce new venom after it bites? That's a, a good question. I'm actually not sure on that. I know that it probably depends on the size, but with, with certain animals, I know I tend to tell folks this, that like if an animal tries to bite, um, it's losing because it will have to, to get more venom and it's using that. But it just depends on how much they're giving. If, if they bite and inject a lot of venom, I imagine it'll probably take a lot longer to get that. And if it's a dry bite, you know, they still have venom that they can produce. But as for how long, I'm actually not sure about that. It's a good question. I'll have to, I'll have to look it up too. Cool. Um, and I've been loving like all the evolutionary tidbits you um, have been adding throughout the presentation. And Julio, yeah, asked, um, Julio asked a cool, in, interesting question. Um, he's heard that some rattlesnakes are adapting not to rattle anymore in maybe in response to poaching. Do you know anything about that? I've, I've heard briefly about that. I haven't looked it up uh, much, but something like that isn't impossible. There's a rattlesnake that's found on the Channel Islands that doesn't have a rattle. And I think when it's born, like the rattle falls off and that happened in response to hunting birds. And so it was more detrimental. Again, this is all happening in evolutionary time, but it was more detrimental for that snake to have a rattle because it scared off the prey. And so something like that isn't uncommon. It's happening with elephants in Africa. The, the elephants have like, there's a selective pressure on elephants to lose these magnificent tusks because they're more likely to get poached. So that's definitely happening. As for rattlesnakes, I'm not sure if it's happening, but again, it's, it's not out of the question. It would have to be a pretty severe pressure though. Um, so people would have to be constantly getting them, but it's, that's a good question for sure. Awesome. And then we'll take um, a, one last question, which has to do with our theme of myths um, and truths. But is it true that uh, like after getting bitten, if you, you know, walk and move, does that distribute the venom throughout the body? Or mm -hmm. That's a that's also a good question. I don't actually know the answer to that. But I know that regardless, if you were bit, you wouldn't likely wouldn't get treated right there on the spot, you'd have to get moved eventually. So I think that um, it would take some time and it, it really just depends on how long it's been. But I think the number one thing is just trying your best to, to call, to call and get treated appropriately and fast. And usually you'll be okay with a, hopefully a pretty good story to tell. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jeffrey. This has been a great talk and thanks everybody who attended today. Um, I'll be sending out an email afterwards with a quick survey, um, links to the resources, and I also want to plug um, an upcoming training we have on LA habitats, um, and we're asking the question if we're in a concrete jungle or a biodiversity haven, so that one's coming up in May 18th, so check it out and register at the Training Institute website, and thanks everybody so much. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you all so much.